Um, it's lovely to see so many um, familiar faces and getting to know new ones. Um, my name is Patrice Campion and I've been invited by Mary and Jim to do the interview with um, Dr. Terry Lynch. Um, for me, Dr. Lynch um, really was an inspiration when I read Beyond Prozac uh, some years ago, it was 2001, and really, really, um, I had already known what I thought I knew, had known, but I didn't have it written in any kind of a book anywhere. When I found Dr. Terry Lynch's book, Beyond Prozac, it really, really changed my entire world, um, and so I'm quite honored to be here uh, today. So, um, I, here we are, you know, and this is uh, the new book, De Depression Delusion. So it's many years later. Um, how many years are you talking? Thirteen. Since Beyond Prozac, yeah. uh, first uh, fourteen since the fir fourteen years since the first. Fourteen edition. years since the yeah. first. So I, I really um, I know many of uh, many of us will have the same questions. So hopefully we're going to present the questions and then of course we'll open up the format so that anybody else can join in. Um, but initially we just want to understand. How did you come up with the title, Depression Delusion, and what was it that stirred in you that made you want to write about that? Sure. Yeah, just thinking, and first of all, I'm, I'm very happy to be here tonight, and thank you all for coming here and giving your time, and thank you very much to Jim and Mary and everybody in Mind Freedom. I have a long association with, with you all, and I'm very happy to have continue with that, and thank you to Patrice for um, helping out here in terms of discussion. Um, right, now, I suppose I should start by saying that I intend over the next 20, 30 years to write a series of books and that it will be one of the most important parts of my life. And as I thought about the books, I have a list of about 15 in my, in my mind. The next one is the first draft is already written. But I thought, what book do I need to start with? And, and I, I thought about the, you know, I had to address the current situation first uh, before I could really move on to the next step. Before I just deal with what Patricia said, or Patricia said, could I just ask a general question? How many of you have heard, have been told, or have just heard from reputable people, be it in the media, friends, etc., that there's a chemical imbalance in depression? Just put your hands up. How many people have heard that? Yeah. Right. That's a lot of people. That's at least half, if not more than that. Um, and I. So I, I decided that had to be the first book. Now, depression, delusion, the myth of the brain chemical imbalance. What I'm really trying to address here is the myth of the brain chemical imbalance. And I picked the word delusion because it is a delusion. Um, and I, the front cover, you know, the flat earth, is because this delusion, global, almost global delusion at this stage, is at least as um, prevalent as the uh, flat earth idea for four, 400 years ago was. So I, I just, I picked the title for that reason, really. Um, I think as well as that, we have to re-examine depression itself. I think we are somewhat deluded about depression in society as well. But my main intention there was, was the chemical imbalance. I really think we have to reappraise what this thing called depression is. And one of the main problems about the chemical imbalance thing is that that has distorted our attention. It is, people think, oh, that's the chemical imbalance, yes. Oh, that's the brain thing, isn't it? And actually, what, what I've realized, and I think a lot of you have realized, is that it, it's, it's not fundamentally about the brain at all. It's about, it's about woundedness and trauma. It's about the distress that, that trauma causes. Uh, little traumas, big traumas. It's about the defense mechanisms we create in response to the woundedness and the distress. And, in, and our choice making is in there somewhere too. But our choice making is compromised by the previous three. Now, they have nothing to do with biology. Um, now, biology will reflect them, certainly. Like, the brain will reflect how we are. Sorry not to be going on, I've gone way off track, but I do that all the time. Um, <coughs> a very important point in all of this. One of the mistakes we've made in society, and I think this is drug company and, medic and psychiatry driven, is we've got mixed up about the brain. We, we've, as a society, we, and, and this is international, uh, we seem to have concluded that the brain is the master. Whereas actually, if you sit back and look at it, the brain is largely the servant, the servant of the being, the servant of the mind. And so we're putting all this attention into the brain, which is the servant of the mind. 
And the brain naturally is going to respond to trauma. But the brain is not the orchestrator of the trauma. The brain is reflecting and responding to the trauma. So we need to shift our attention away from the biological brain and deal with what has actually happened to people. Um, Eleanor Lundon, you may some of you may have come across her in a TED talk. She's a psychologist in, in, in Britain who has made a complete recovery from schizophrenia. And she often says, you know, we shouldn't be asking what's wrong with you, we should be asking what happened to you. And I, I completely agree with that. And sometimes we don't remember what happened to us. But the evidence, I see it every, with every person, I would say, over the last 10 years. And I can never see evidence of chemical imbalances because you cannot ever check for them. So rather than get preoccupied with this idea that can never be proven, why don't we deal with what's directly in front of us, which is people, we're all humans, we get hurt, we get traumatized, little things can traumatize us. And we live in a society that does not recognize that. And the mental profession is contributing to that by sidelining trauma as an issue and putting depression in there as the centerpiece. Um, <clears throat> one interesting thing I came across recently was um, <clears throat> if you compare the, defi the definitions of trauma and depression, to have a, di to have a diagnosis of trauma, a medical diagnosis of trauma, uh, you have to have had something very, very major happen to you like uh, witnessing a shooting or a major car crash or something really, or sexual assault, bad sexual assault, that kind of level of something happening to you. Um, whereas with depression, uh, two weeks of not feeling so good will qualify you for, for a diagnosis of depression, which will explain why, which contributes to, to explaining why 60 million prescriptions nearly at this stage are written in Britain every year for antidepressants. And you can be sure that there's an equivalent figure in Ireland. Whereas you know, um, I, I, in, in research actually for the next book, I, I came across uh, something in the NHS, um, the National Health Service in, 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 in Britain. And I think one of, the, one, of the things, one of the reasons I'm so passionate about this is that when I see stuff <clears throat> and I read it and I say to myself, that just doesn't make sense. And, it's, and a 12 year old would know that that doesn't make sense. And yet this is what the mental profession is telling people is real. <clears throat> and the thing I came across in the NHS, uh, it was an official National Health Service uh, trauma uh, site, I suppose, advising people about trauma. And they actually said that things like divorce, uh, job loss, exam failure, that they're simply upsetting. They, they're not, they don't cause trauma. And I thought, ask any 12 year old whose parents have divorced, you know, is it merely upsetting? Or, you know, the people who've been involved in it, everybody's been involved in a divorce, it's merely upsetting. And I think it is a very deliberate, um, and I think for some people involved in the system, they're not conscious really of what they're doing. But the effect of it all is to create a system which sidelines human experience really, and reinterprets it in medical language, and in a way, um, what's the word for it? when a country captures another country, there's a word for it. Um, Conquers, yes. It's like they conquer and, and make it in their terrain. So distress becomes a medic within the medical terrain. It shouldn't be. It's human experience, as I said, and it needs to be worked through and not just medicated. To me, it's about, actually it's about logic and science, really. Um, but what I've learned is that my medical colleagues can fi often find it very difficult to go beyond a certain point in examining stuff. Like one thing that has struck me over the years is, you know, I would know, and I, I just did a very brief exercise uh, recently, and I looked back and I thought, well, how many people do I know who've had a, a bipolar diagnosis? And I mean, you know, would have, would have qualified for a full medical diagnosis of bipolar with hospital admissions and real, real you know, highs and lows. How many do I, could I think of in five minutes that I have met, worked with, or not worked with, over the past six, seven years, or five years actually, I think it was, who've made a complete recovery from off all medications. And within about three or four minutes, I came up with about 13 people. Now, most psychiatrists would say to you, that doesn't happen. Bipolar is a chemical imbalance, they would tell you, and like diabetes, you need treatment for life. Well, that just, again, there's another word for coming. Like, if that flies in the face of what I have seen and what I know, and it flies in the face of what a lot of other people know. So, 
you know, the question strikes me, well, why, if this is possible, if recovery is possible, why is it not center stage? You know, it's center stage in every other area of medicine. I mean, somebody who gets breast cancer or a neurological problem or a heart problem, the doctors will always aim for the best possible outcome. And then they will measure what they do in accordance with how the person does. But their initial thing will be, how far can we get this person? That's not the case in psychiatry, generally speaking. It's a, what happens in psychiatry is, we'll aim for maintenance for life. And there's rarely an idea, perhaps in the very early stages, but there's rarely a sense of, you know, with, with a lot of work and a lot of support and a lot of help, maybe this person can really get their life back on track. Um, anyway, that's a long way to answer. Yeah. That actually opens up an awful lot of opportunity for more discussion, um, because this is clearly <coughs> the, the response goes into the, the political, medical, systemic, in terms of how the, the system takes care of people and how it doesn't take care of people. And you, you, raised, you, you pointed out something about how it flies in the face the logic of what you've examined in your own practice yes. as a GP and in your practice as a, as a psychotherapist. And yet, there's still, um, the status quo, if you will, is still maintaining this chemical imbalance theory. Yeah. Um, but it's interesting that Mary could introduce the, the topic tonight by speaking from the book of, of, from 2003, and nothing's really changed except for awareness. It seems that there is a lot of awareness out there, and although um, the book that in chapter two, I think it is, I think you've cited more than 60 different references of where people, uh, professional researchers, scientists, biologists, um, therapists, doctors, have all more or less pointed towards the same conclusion, that the chemical imbalance theory is, is, is a fallacy. So what is going on that this is still something that is being completely um, used in the system. Yeah, sure. can, can you speak to that? Sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll just begin in answering that. Um, I did an awful lot of research for this book because I, I, um, I knew I had to get it right. I knew that um, I, I was leaving myself open to be criticized, to be shut down. So I, I did an awful lot of research. There's about, about a thousand references in the book. But they're just to validate the material. It's not, a, it's, not, it's not an academic book, it's for the public. But this is one of the things I came across. <coughs> um, you know, I've read a lot of books written by psychiatrists. There are so many flaws in most of them. One of the best I read was a, a book called, uh, it was by Psych American Psychiatrist 2010, Daniel Carlett, Unhinged Psychi Psychiatry of Profession in Crisis. That was something like that was the title. And the book was a mixture of truth and not untruth. But a lot of revelations, and he was crying out really. You could see that he was lost in his profession. And I would say a lot of psychiatrists are lost in their profession. But they're so, they're so embedded in the system, they are, their whole status, their financial world depends on it. So they, they don't, most of them probably see there's not a whole lot else they can do. But I found this particular thing very revealing. Daniel Carlin was, was being interviewed in an American radio station. And uh, <clears throat> anyway, it's a direct quote. What we don't know is how the medications actually work in the brain. So whereas it's not uncommon, and I still do this actually when a patient asks me about these medications, I'll often say something like, well, the way Zoloft, Zoloft is the American name for, I can't, is it Lustral? One of, one of the ones that's used here a great deal anyway. So the way Lust, uh, Zoloft works is it increases the level of serotonin in your brain, in your synapses, the neurons, and presumably the reason you're depressed or anxious is that you have some sort of deficiency. And this is, the, this is the bit. And I say this not because I believe it, because I know that the evidence isn't really there for us to understand the mechanism. I think I say that because patients want to know something, and they want to know that we as physicians have some basic understanding of what we're doing when we're prescribing medication. And they certainly don't want to hear that a psychiatrist essentially has no idea how these medications work. He's admitting he doesn't have any idea how the drugs work, but he's deluded himself into thinking that he's telling it for the patient's benefit. He's telling it for his own benefit. Because doctors need the credibility um, to be seen as scientists. Uh, uh, people will very reasonably ask in any situation with a doctor, doctor, how does this drug work? And that's, the chemical imbalance has 
been so, so important for the medical profession because it provided a legitimacy, a, val a validity to the prescription. And it conveyed the idea that these doctors were actually scientific in what they were doing. And yet, I, you know, the old saying, um, uh, what is it, um, kind of something like, believe what I do as I do, not as I say, you know, um, Say not as I do. Yeah. Well, do as I say, not as I do. Yeah. Um, you know, what I suppose what I'm trying to say is that their behaviour and how they approach people with depression is so out of kilter with how any uh, biochemical condition is dealt with. I mean, another ridiculous comparison that's frequently made is comparing depression to, to diabetes. Scientifically, that's an absolutely ridiculous co comparison. They're they're like chalk and cheese, the two. With, with diabetes, the whole situation is so precise. Um, nobody, I mean, a doctor would find himself in court and would possibly be struck off if he or she diagnosed diabetes without blood sugar levels. It's just unheard of. With depression, everybody's diagnosed with this illness without investigations. So everything that is right about diabetes in terms of chemical imbalances is wrong in depression. So why would doctors do this? You see, I think it comes back, and I'm not trying to nail people here, and I'm not trying to, I'm just trying to tell it as I see it. And it struck me, and we've seen this in Irish society, we've seen it elsewhere. You know, what is the number one priority of groups? It is themselves. It is their own, their own, the propagation of what they, who they are and what they do. And you could say that about an awful lot of groups and organizations. It's a very common human thing. So, the medical profession, particularly psychiatry, and general practice, because general practice is wrapped up in this, not nearly as much as, as psychiatry, but they are wrapped up in it. They've committed so much to this idea now of biology and depression that there's really, it's very difficult to see them back down because they would lose so much face. So I think that's one of the main reasons they have kept up this idea. They need it desperately. And if that idea is to go, it has to be substituted by another idea that will take its place, that will convince the public. And that's the key thing. And that's why, that's why I've addressed this book not to professionals. I've learned over the years that that's a waste of time. Because professionals have their own belief system and they really don't want to hear. They don't want to be seriously challenged. So the public, however, don't have those investments. They don't have that investment. Now, there, there is some societal investment all right in maintaining this solution and i think that's why it has survived so long the public must have some interest in it as well um you know way back in the 70s uh, homosexuality was a mental illness and it was removed from i'm not sure which of the dsm's uh, i think it was dsm3 actually yeah but in 19 in the mid, in the mid 1970s uh gay rights groups and the whole civil rights movement in america became so strong that psychiatry were put on the back foot about this, and they did respond, they actually removed. So one day, homosexuality was a mental disorder, and then the next day it wasn't. Um, but I think, looking at that, I think what happened there was, it was a trade-off. As far as psychiatry is concerned, that was a trade-off. They still had all the other conditions. Um, whereas, when, you, when they're challenged directly about everything they do, then they have nothing else to fall back on, so they really need to defend themselves. I'm not trying to criticize here, but I've learned over the years, I don't think they really know what else to do. I don't think GPs know a whole lot else what to do, other than prescribe. Many GPs may feel, and some do, refer to therapists, and that's great, but they don't know themselves what to do. And, and, they, and they're, they're at the center of the services. So I think there needs to be a fundamental review of of this whole mental health issue. And people's experiences need to be put at the heart of it. And, and you take it from there. Did I even answer that question? No, again, again yeah. it leads to more. Yeah. You know, just as we've probably, most of us know, um, this topic, the book, the book is, is seriously a labyrinth of, of knowledge and information that continues to beg the question, why is, this continue to be perpetuated. And it, I think if, if, if I might go back into the book, yeah. um, how you, you wrote about 
a little bit of that according to the DSM and how that was established and how that was um, put together as a, as a manual for diagnosis. Yeah. And the science behind it is actually proven to be very unscientific. Right. And you wrote about that, and if you wouldn't mind yeah. uh, just speaking a little bit about that, because many people wouldn't know that the DSM, which is the Diagnostic Statistic Manual, in its fifth series, um, has been used as the Bible for diagnosis throughout the world, well, mostly in America, but it's the ICD here in the European Union. And it still it borrows from that. It takes not much of its uh, basis from that. So yeah. Can, yeah, sure. can you please? Um... Yeah, I mean, the misinformation that comes through from on high in this whole mental health area, the, the, the chemical imbalance bit is just one, but many others. Uh, and this is the whole DSM thing is, is one because it's presented as a highly scientific uh, document, and it is you know that plus a thing called the ICD-10. They are the they are the guiding lights for psychiatry and consequently for general practice. So you know they are very very important documents, but they're they're created by consensus. There's no science in the DSM. It's all consensus. So groups of psychiatrists, mainly from the American Psychiatric Association, get together, and and I don't mean this in a critical way, but it's not unlike the way the Pope is elected. They, it really isn't. They meet in secret, they have their secret meetings, they thrash things around for quite some time, and eventually they come to their conclusion. Now, I came across something that just hit me between my eyes uh, in, in research, and I'll just read a little bit and talk a bit about it. So, the DSM, there have been five, five editions, and I think one or two revisions of editions. <coughs> Um, the current situation with depression in terms of diagnosis. Now, I've said before, and I'll say it again, you know, I'm not, I've noticed a few psychiatrists and GPs, um, when people like me uh, question the, uh, the, whole, the whole idea of depression, the way it's medically presented, they've turned it around, and what they try to say is, Oh, and, and one psychiatrist actually said this in the ra on the Pat Kenny show. He wasn't talking about me. He was just in general. He's, in a, his comment was, "Well, you know, some people seem to seem to think that um, it's not okay, or that people don't suffer in this way." Um, so they turn it around as if, "Oh, well, people like me are saying that people aren't suffering," and that's not what we're saying at all. And I think he knows that. That's and, and, but it suits them to say that. What I'm saying is, I know damn well that people suffer a great deal but how we're interpreting it is wrong. So if we get it wrong in the first step, we're going to get it wrong in many of the other steps. And I'm also saying, I'm not saying medication has no role. Medication can be very helpful for a lot of people. So, but I think we have to address this, this idea that it's the answer and, and be truthful about how it acts. I mean, medication changes how people feel fundamentally. That's really its main action. Anyway, so um, the current diagnostic system in terms of depression. That was first introduced in the DSM-3, which was published in 1980. And the head guy of that is American psychiatrist Robert Spitzer. Right? Now that system pertains to this day, and it's presented as a very scientific system. And it was funny. I, it, in Beyond Prozac, as I was going through stuff, I actually posed a question that Daniel Carl posed later, and I'll come to that in a second. But I posed the question beyond, beyond um, Prozac. Psychiatry has decided that it's five criteria out of ten, and you have a diagnosis of depression. Five. Now, to be honest, a lot of doctors don't do that. They just make a diagnosis a lot quicker than that. They don't figure out, well, this is five. But in the book, as I was, thinking, as I was writing Beyond Prozac, I said to myself, why five? Why not three? Why not seven? Why not eight? There's no science. So I just thought, why, why five? They didn't explain why five. It was a consensus. And anyway, Daniel Carlett, who was clearly struggling, as I said in that, that book, Unhinged, um, great title for a book for psychiatry, Unhinged, The Trouble of Psychiatry, A Doctor's Revelation About a Professional Crisis. But he asked, he had an interview with, he, he made it his business to meet Robert Spitzer, who was the head of the 1980 DSM. And he asked him the same question I put in Beyond Prozac, why five? And this was the, this was the conversation, right? So Carlett asked him, how did you decide on five criteria as being a minimum threshold for depression? And Spitzer replied, it was just consensus. We would ask clinicians and researchers, and this is the question he'd ask, they'd ask them, how many symptoms do you think patients ought to have before you would give them a diagnosis of depression? And we came up with an arbitrary number of five. And Carla said, why did you not choose five, or why did you choose five and not four? 
Or why did you choose six? And Spitzer said, because four just seemed like not enough, and six seemed like too much. <laughs> this is the head of the DSM. <coughs> and Carnot commented that, uh, and this is a direct quote from his book, Spitzer smiles, smiles mischievously as he utters the last sentence. So it's kind of like he knows. But it's protecting the system is the number one. Um, another interesting thing I came across, I'm on George Hook tomorrow at 5.30, and, and this may well come up on his, his show because it was on his show, it happened, but some of you might remember about two years ago, uh, a really excellent uh, journalist student, Neve Gro Drogan, uh, did a study and it was published, I think, on the front page of the Examiner. And she went to seven GPs in the Waterford area um, saying that she had various headache and not sleeping, and she was a student, etc. All seven prescribed antidepressants. And she had nothing. She had no symptoms. She was just going in to see what would happen. And George Hook thought this was quite significant as well. So he had an interview on, and he had a GP on. And the GP slated the reviewer, or the researcher, and said, well, we don't expect people to come in and tell us a pack of lies. <laughs> and she completely <laughs> missed the point. The point was, the criteria for diagnosing depression are so weak that doctors are completely dependent on interpretation. Nobody could, could feign a diagnosis of, of diabetes. Impossible. Or multiple sclerosis or anything like that because there would be tests done. But what struck me, and it will, you know, I, I will it'll make about tomorrow, but it was nothing to do with George, but the GP came down on that researcher so hard and what was screaming out there was your, your, uh, your, your diagnostic ability here is so, so unscientific. But that was too difficult a question for that GP, so it was like attacking the best form of defense. So again, another example, for me anyway, of number one, we protect the system. And the, the thing is, I suppose, what, what I'm trying to get across in, these, in some of these books is that people don't realize that. The public think of doctors as very trustworthy, and of course they are. But in this area of mental health, there's so little actual evidence that I think doctors feel they have little choice if they want to continue convincing people of resorting to half-truths, quarter-truths, falsehoods, um, exaggeration, etc. Um, actually, that is just where I was hoping you'd stop, um, because I'd like to ask you about how, in your experience, especially as a GP, when you have your patients and you've, you've told them that you believe that they would benefit by a certain prescription of whatever antidepressant, and then they have more or less gotten the feeling that their symptoms have abated and sure. ameliorated. Um, but some people say that even though we know that the, the medication that has been prescribed in the short term can help, how is it that we explain, how is it that you would explain in the long term where the harm can start? Sure. Um, so there is a societal issue here, and it is, I think, a collective societal fear of emotions and the expression of emotions. And when people are going through, for example, emotional crises, you know, they're in a place of high emotions, and people get terrified. Um, so, and again, I can see why they might get terrified. And, but I think we, we really have to shift our focus to dealing primarily with what, peop what people are actually experiencing, rather than reinterpreting that and then treating what we have interpreted to be. Because that's, that's taking it away from what it is and making it something else. Sorry, yeah. Hi, sorry, Kevin Foley. Hi, Kevin. Hey, you know me. The whole thing is the emotion turmoil when you're not feeling well, you know, you know what I've gone through. And that's exactly what they're doing. A gentleman up front used the word mentally ill. I would absolutely, totally disagree with using that word. The, the language is like a you law, know, that's what they make money through, and the medical profession use. They spin words that people would be familiar with, you know. He has to be very educated and say English or the English literature, which would be my strong area, but I have a really good education background. Um, so the, the people, it's an emotional turmoil. And people then are reduced to a pulp by 20 years of medication, which is never going to help anybody. Yeah. And if you're probably fair, said, if you're involved in sport, he's given a painting injection, not given 20 years of, of, of painting injections. Well, that's that's true too. And uh, 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 that's physical. So why would you treat an emotional illness for 30 years? <coughs> you know what happened to my brother last time? It's, just, you know, yeah. it's happening to many different people in this country. I don't know. 
Well, that's another example of, I, as I'm saying, the, the more I thought about this, the more, and the more I applied logic. I mean, in, in, in this book, I have, <coughs> I've approached it on a number of levels, but one of the levels is logic. I've, you know, I've, logic. I have a lot of examples, for example, of logical fallacies in this book. There must be over a hundred of, of logical fallacies. In other words, things that don't stand up even to logic. Now, you won't, generally speaking, find that in neurology or cardiology, because these doctors tend to be very um, disciplined in, their, in the way they lead from one point to another and to another and to another. But because there isn't any body of, um, of solid biological science that psychiatry can hold on to, they flit from thing to thing, and they have to use um, logical fallacies to convince people. And I have, I would say there's at least a hundred obvious logical fallacies mentioned in the book. And, you know, um, it often struck me, for example, uh, you know, that medica another, another word we could use for psychiatric medication is an emotional painkiller. Because that's what they do, they kill emotional pain temporarily. Now, not in everybody, people sometimes have the opposite reaction. Um, but as I kind of played with that idea and took it to the next step and then the next step, and I, a bit like what you were saying, Kevin, you know, how do doctors generally deal with pain? Do they generally, at the first step, put people on painkillers and then leave them on painkillers for 20 years? No, they don't. In fact, that's the last thing they will do. They will investigate and try to find out what the pain is and try to treat the underlying cause of the pain. Um, there are very few people who would go to a doctor and find themselves you know, at, at the first step or you know, as the first main thrust of treatment being put on long-term painkillers for, for whatever physical problem without it being fully investigated and without, without a physical diagnosis made. So the contrast is, is, of the two is, is really quite interesting. When you launched the book Selfridge, what, I, what I'm just wondering is like, that night, Kathleen Lynch, the Minister for uh, Health or whatever was there, and like she seemed to be supportive of the idea that they'd be community based and that there would be alternatives and help. And we agree that it's usually if you speak long enough to somebody and can empathise, like if people are lucky enough to be able to go to yourself or somebody like minded, but like really, realistically, that's not available. There's, there is nothing. I know somebody who works in crisis area, and like there is kind of nothing from Friday still to yeah. Monday. So like, you know, is, do you know if there's anything definitely being done to help people look at the alternatives? And um, you know, I'm just wondering that. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not hugely involved in, I was for nine years, and I was on the Vision for Change group and then the implementation group for six years after that, but that finished in 2012. I haven't been involved at a national level, really. You see, the problem comes down to the fundamental belief systems. Um, and again, this is where the chemical imbalance idea is so important. As long as these issues are seen as fundamentally biological, uh, then the powers that be see things like counselling as, oh, well, you know, it might help a little bit, but it's not the essence of the treatment. It's kind of like, um, yeah, it's grand, like, but, that, you know, the doctors will do the serious stuff, the really important stuff. They'll do the prescribing, that's the key. And so we'll bring in a therapist to help out a little bit over here. It's not core. So it doesn't get the validation. Now, I'm not suggesting that it's all about therapy either. There are people who've made recoveries and they've never seen it Because to me it seems to be about finding your way back. Finding your way back to who you are, to a life that works for you. It's a journey. And you know, people <coughs> have done that without therapists. So I'm not saying, oh, you know, it's all about, I'm not saying medication is bad, therapy is fabulous. Some people have found therapy very helpful, others haven't. But the thing, you know, the reason I suppose I try to aim at the public is that the public have a huge role here. Um, public opinion, is a sleeping giant. And if public opinion would wake up on this one, it wouldn't be long before there would be change. It really wouldn't. It, it may sound like a poor analogy, but you might remember 15, 20 years ago, whenever it was, a uh, plastic bag tax came in. Within months, the litter problems in this country just reduced. People thought, oh, we can't adapt to that. And they did. The public got behind an idea. Getting the public behind an idea is crucial. 
and that's why. It, so, <coughs> see, even if there were lots more therapists, even w if it's if it's within that bio many biologically dominated system, I think their ability to to really, really make a difference is compromised anyway. I've worked with people who've, who've worked with therapists within the system, and a lot of therapists within the system either either kind of what's the word? They they are uh, subordinate to the to the medical role, or if, if they even if they don't agree with the medical role, they they feel in their position quite often they can't really speak much. So. To me, the problem is the fundamental problem is the ideology, the whole belief system um, that has to go. It really does, and I think. Um, but in terms of, you know, I don't see. I don't. I haven't heard of much happening, and I. No, I, I don't I think just so. Might add to that that where more of the resources for therapy seem to be going is amongst the charities like AWARE, Pieta House, Console, it's the charities that seem to be taking the lead in terms of providing alternatives, which is an awful shame, really, that it's not coming from the mainstream. I'd also say as a therapist myself that having recently met a group of therapists in Dublin who are also working and doing great work, that we need as therapists to organise ourselves a little bit more to challenge, mm -hmm. to write to psychiatrists and say, well, this person is recovered now, mm -hmm. you know, and to link in. It, it's difficult. That there's no receptivity there as a therapist. You're not treated as an equal mm -hmm. if you write to a psychiatrist. That's you are very true, much yeah. seen as an annoyance. Yeah. But I do feel as therapists that we need to organise ourselves a little bit better to have a more maybe structured approach to it, you know, to challenge. Yeah. One, one yeah. of the, you see, I suppose, again, why I wrote this book and called it Depression Delusion and put the cover of the Fat Earth in the cover is that this idea has infiltrated everywhere. It's actually infiltrated psychology, <coughs> it's infiltrated therapy, <coughs> it's infiltrated... I mean, Patrick Holford on his website has so many examples of misinformation and in his, in his book Nutrition for the Mind. In terms of serotonin, he has so much misinformation. Um, I'm sure, it's, I'm sure it's, it's, he, he doesn't realise it. But if you read my book, you'll realize it. Because we cannot say that people have a deficiency in serotonin when that's never been identified. But to get back to what you were talking about. See, a lot of psychologists and therapists themselves believe in the chemical idea. So they themselves feel subordinate because they have bought into this idea that the fundamental issue is biological, so the doctor is the main expert. So they, they, they kind of bow to that if you know what I'm saying. So what I, what I was trying to do with this book is to get this out there so people would, the public would say, <coughs> okay, we're not going to believe this anymore, so what the hell is this thing called depression? And then we're on a more even ground and we can address it more evenly without one group having, inappropriately having, um, a casting vote and a veto vote. Mm -hmm. Sorry, um, can I just say something? Um, do you find that, you know, you answered, First question there, why did you call it depression to delusion? Do you not find they keep moving goalposts? You know, that it was depression, then it was bipolar, and it had to be mania and depression and bipolar. Now it's just if you've got moods either way, if you don't have to have both, then they moved around to borderline <coughs> personality disorder. They seem, I mean, for somebody who's interested, sort of without any background in the whole thing, they seem to keep moving goalposts on people. Yeah. You know, as soon as we start sort of organizing ourselves, you know, um, yes. as people with mental health problems, they move the goalposts again. Yeah, Do you know? that's true. I, I mean, I've, I've been aware of that for a long time. Um, and many, many people have come to that over the years. <coughs> and it's no coincidence, I think. Like, if you look at um, what the recurring theme is in the moving of the goalposts, you will usually find that a drug has been found that the doctors are enthusiastic about. So when, and that's true, when the SSRIs came in, the diagnosis, the frequency of diagnosis, like, I think the frequency of diagnosis of depression is about a thousand fold more than what it was 50 years ago. A thousand fold, that's a, multiply by a thousand. Now that's not how biological illnesses, that's not the pattern. No biological <coughs> illness has increased a thousand fold in 50 years. It just doesn't happen. It's an interpretation, and it's it's because these drugs came, so <coughs> doctors could now call anxiety depression. So the whole thing shifted to depression because we have a drug, 
and it's like, oh my God, we, we can do something. And so you can understand that, th that thinking, but there are massive, massive consequences. And with bipolar, it's something similar. The, the, the rates of diagnosis of bipolar, now figures-wise, I haven't got them at this time, but they have also have gone up enormously in the past 10, 15 years. Why? Because doctors have got enthusiastic about the drugs, and doctors have got less enthusiastic about the drugs for schizophrenia. So I'm not quite sure if this is correct, but my, my sense is that the diagnostic rate of, of schizophrenia <coughs> is certainly static or falling, but the diagnosis, diagnostic rate of bipolar is increasing. So you do get flavor of the month conditions, and they're almost always linked with the doctors have feeling, well, we have a drug now we, are, we feel is good, or, or we have a handle on this condition, if you know what I'm saying. That's my could reading of it. Say, and that's other people's readings. I've seen several doctors <coughs> over the years who study this saying that, and I think it's the best it's the best explanation I can come up with. It appears to me that there's an increase in suicide amongst particularly young people. Mm. And so is that due to the lack of psychiatric input or more increased or is it due to the increase in the amount of medications or the prescriptions? Like it appears that there is definitely an increase in suicide. Yeah. I think suicide, and I, I'm, I'm looking forward to writing a book on that, now that, that will be, I'm not sure where it's on this exactly. Suicide needs to be addressed. It is not being addressed properly, at all. And, you know, I don't mean this to, to sound harsh or anything like that, but I, I, think, I think suicide has been hijacked by the mental profession. Because suicide is about pain and hurt, and overwhelm, and complete sense of loss, and to reach that point usually, there's been a lead-in period of immense pain and distress. The, the medical model um, <coughs> changes that into, an, you know, I mean, you hear doctors saying that, 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 that suicide is, that the majority is 80% or or 70% of suicides are, are linked to depression, mm -hmm. are caused by depression. Again, the idea of the, the whole, the begging, the begging the question logical fallacy comes in here all the time. Because if you bring it back, and you bring it back, and you bring it back, well, what is depression? And doctors then say, of course, well, it's a, it's a chemical imbalance, or it's a brain problem. It isn't. It's the things I was saying earlier. It's trauma, it's woundedness, it's distress. And if you think about it, the vast majority of people take their life. That's what's going on for them. They have a story of trauma, they're in great distress, um, and in its own way, suicide is a defense mechanism. It's a way of avoiding, not avoiding, but ending my pain. So we, I think that we will only address suicide properly when we grow up as a society. Um, suicide has become, it's one of these things that's talked about and yet not really talked about. And depression is a bit like that as well. Um, a lot of talk about depression, but the heart of depression, the hurt, the pain, the sorrow, the, the actual experiences that people are having, the, you know, shutdown, withdrawal, avoidance, these are core features of depression. They need to be talked about. They need to be, and got out of this umbrella, umbrella term, depression. Um, depression really, as, as John Waters wrote once, he was actually commenting in my book, Beyond Prozac, you know, telling us we're depressed tells us nothing. It doesn't really help us that much. But if you break it down, you know, to, to shut down, people shutting down, but that's something perhaps we can work with, or withdrawal, or avoidance, or the mask we feel we have to, to wear. You know, if we, if we break it down to, and, and then work with that, then you're getting to the heart of the matter. So I think, I think the, you know, there are lots of reasons why, why the suicide rate has gone up. Lots of reasons. Um, yeah, sure. I, know, I, I would say as well, I know, I know that many people feel very overwhelmed and yes. we do very unusual things and we are overwhelmed, but also it is true because I know from personal experience that, that when you take certain drugs, they can change you so much, you will do things you couldn't believe you do. Like I remember when I was um, a young woman, and I was in Dublin, and I was lived in a, in a flat then with a few other women, and they were taking um, uh, street drugs at the time, 
and uh, LSD was one of the, the drugs that would be taken quite often, and some of the girls would change completely when they take the LSD. They would say, um, you know, um, I had a good trip this time, and I may have had a bad trip another time. And, and I know people, who, I, when I was in group therapy myself earlier on, they would have said that they would, would fly out of, you know, they would actually walk out over, th that you would never do if you weren't taking these drugs. I'm, I'm sorry, but these drugs can cause that, and I, I'm one of those people who know that. Are you talking about psychiatric drugs? Yes, or are you psychiatric talking about drugs. illegal drugs? I talk about psychiatric drugs. Yeah, and it's when you're on an anti-psychotic and you've been on it for a while and you stop your medication at once, you go psychotic. It's not the person that's at fault, it's the medication. The medication has put a hold on the body and when that is stopped abruptly, you go crazy. And so that's you end so. up being, you end up, yes. you, you get very violent, and you end up going back into hospital. You, you'll either be picked up by the guards, and you're back, you're back in a locked ward, back on your medication again. That's what an anti, to say about anti-psychotic medicine, any time I look in the headlines, um, there's a website, Critical Voices, and people will examine, like, someone's up in headlines for killing people, suicides, and they're all on medication. And they've stopped either abruptly or they haven't identified what was... If someone has a trauma in their early years and they're on medication and they come off it, that trauma is still active. But, like, the doctors put us on antipsychotic medication. And it's, um, I don't know, I just think as a person, we're not being treated properly. You know, the, the oath that doctors take, we're like guinea pigs. It, it's Absolutely. Um, and it's another reason why there has to be leveling of the playing field pitch here. Um, the doctors are up here telling everybody what's good for them. Um, they need to come down to the same level so that there's an equality of discussion. Um, in my opinion, the whole medical approach to mental health, it is a belief system. Fundamentally, it's a belief system. It has, there's no scientific evidence in terms of abnormalities, so it's not evidence-based. It's faith-based. So it's a belief system. Now, and what happens within the system is very similar to what happens within any belief system. You are ostracized if you go against the belief systems. I've been ostracized as a doctor, and a person saying to their psychiatrist, I want to come off medication, or can, or can I work to come off the medication? Very rarely will the psychiatrist say, yeah, look, I'll work with you on that. Um, it's usually, mm, I don't know about that now, and, and I can see to some of their logic. <coughs> but it goes beyond that. Um, and you're absolutely right, I've seen that many, many times, how lonely people feel. Because whenever a person, and it's rare, say somebody is admitted to, to a neurology or to a psychiatric ward and they're found to have a, a brain tumor or something. That's very, very rare. Um, they will then immediately be transferred to whatever ward it should be, neurology or neurosurgery. So that idea that, oh yes, we are, we are biological people, yeah, we haven't really identified what's going on completely yet, but we're very close. You know, that's what's often said. And that keeps people happy. Well, they're not close. Um, I, I mentioned in the book a, a section about drug companies abandoning psychiatry. And that, I came across that a year ago and I went, wow. I was kept very quiet. Several major drug companies have stopped doing, have, have, are now having nothing to do with psychiatric research. And, and many of the others have really toned down their research. Now, drug companies are hard-nosed business people. And they will only tone something down if they've realized, you know, sentiment doesn't come into their thinking. They will only tone down their research if they think they're flogging a dead horse. And that's what's happened for drug companies with psychiatry. Um, and I, I read an article, a, a leading psychiatrist saying that the reason for it was that the, it's ironic really, because it completely contradicts what psychiatry is saying about, about chemical imbalances. The reason drug companies are, are putting out is that they found nothing they can latch onto. They found nothing promising in terms of abnormalities in the brain. So they're leaving. Um, 
And that's, that's a, an, an emerging crisis for psychiatry, but you don't hear much about it because it would be embarrassing for psychiatry, but it's a fact. So there's a lot of stuff going on that the public are not told about. And I think one of the reasons for that is that if the public knew the full truth, um, like doctors, GPs and psychiatrists would be called to account for themselves an awful lot more than they are now. I think, uh, Mary, if this does draw us to the conclusion of the interview, if you're satisfied with that, Dr. Lynch, oh, yeah. as well. But I think that, you know, this is obviously a discussion that can continue. And I know we're going to open up the discussion to continue with yourselves. Um, and I know that we have some people here today who'd like to share their experiences. But I just wanted to say that you were just, you finished, you took the question before I even asked it. And my, quest, my final question was, why Dr. Terry Lynch? Why did you write this? Why, what about you? you know, what compelled you to go this avenue when it would have been so easy and so safe not to? And I do mean safety in terms of, yeah. there is a fallout um, to be expected from pointing to, as you just said, things that are not being told. And here you are exposing, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an expose, it's a forensic expose of the truth. And through very, very uh, irrefutable scientific studies. So what the, the final thing I'd like to close with, if that's all right with you, is just why, why Dr. Terry Lynch? Why did he do this? Just remember that I didn't actually answer your question the first time, so I'm going to quickly answer that and try <coughs> what medication, then I'll come to that. At what point does medication become harmful? I think it's very difficult to give a black and white answer to that. So mm -hmm. some people some people are not harmed, they don't, don't seem to be having harm from medication, and would happily say, 10, 15 years on, I'm fine with my medication, that's fine. But it varies for, for people. But I think for me, one of the... I do think the adverse effects are underestimated. I think they cause far more problems than, than is publicly recognized. Um, but for me, one of the main concerns I have is that what is, and this is, this is true of a lot of areas of life, what is taken as the initial solution will become the problem if the deeper problems or issues aren't dealt with. And that is very true of long-term psychiatric medication. So if somebody's going through an emotional crisis and they're put on medication, I, sometimes I think that's fine, depending on the situation. But if they put on medication and then the medication is rolling on and on and on, well that crisis is not brought through to completion. It's actually stopped. And I think it's like it's almost frozen within the person at that stage. So long-term medication without helping the person work through their crisis, uh, work through their trauma, come out the other side empowered with a sense of, well, I, 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 there was something I could do. I, I could run, or I could, I could do something in this crisis, and come out the other side of it. So I think, personally, think that's actually one of the most insidious and very, very dangerous effects of this long-term medication <coughs> idea, because people become institutionalized over years. They become institutionalized into, into their life, um, quietly living their own lives, restricted though, very restricted lives quite often. And we don't seem to, that seems to be okay with doctors. When people go to doctors, you know, and they're on long-term medication, and four or five years, and the questions are simple, how are you, have you had any suicidal thoughts, whatever it might be, very, very little about, well, how is your life? The obvious one. Because doctors don't deal with a person's life, they deal with their illness. Anyway, um, point me. Well, a number of things. I mean, I suppose it all kind of happened in, in a way it unfolded as I was, my own life was unfolding and I was searching myself and searching, you know, spiritually, emotionally, and truth became a very important issue for me. And I began to, I remember the, you know, working as a GP and believing completely in what I'd been taught. And then people coming into me with stories that would fit into the medical definition, for example, of, of depression, but their story was not getting any airing within the medical thing. And I began to realize, God, this story makes sense. I don't have to call this an illness. I can actually, this story makes sense. Then I began to realize things like bipolar, schizophrenia. I could see things there that I hadn't been taught. I could see, for example, fear, terror, hurt. Uh, with, and then I began to think, well, 
Therefore, the withdrawal might make sense. Therefore, the hearing voices, there might actually be a logic to that. There might be a logic to, um, to, to mania. And I began to realize, for example, as I listened to people, and that was very central to it, really listening to people, um, that there is most definitely a logic to mania, for example. And it's often to escape, to escape from overwhelm. I mean, one of the most important words, in, as far as I am concerned, and Kevin, you mentioned language, you know, the language we use is so, so important. But overwhelm should be the word doctors use most, because that is one of the, one of the most commonly experienced feelings, overwhelm, and the intense emotion of all of that. And so I just began to realize there's a whole story here I wasn't taught about. And I kind of asked myself, okay, which, path, which direction am I going to go? Am I going to keep working in a way that I know, fraud might be too strong a word, but is certainly deceptive. Um, and I said, well, you know, I'm going to hopefully live, this is, this is a while ago, another 40 or 50 years. Um, you know, how do I want to be myself? And, how, and I suppose something I often ask myself is, well, what about when I'm on my deathbed? You know, and I have to, I have to account for myself and I have to look at how I've lived. You know, as I see it, that's a really important day. And I don't want to have to look back and think, oh, you phoned it, you know. I don't want to have to do that. So to me, you know, any price I might pay, it doesn't, it doesn't, um, it's not, it's not nearly as important as, as being true. And, and I suppose in the whole process, I've, I've, I've grown a great deal. And my own personal life as well. I mean, I, I'm not sure if somebody saw that on, um, Monica Sani's uh, Beyond Meds thing. I mean, I wrote a piece that was in, in that and I spoke a bit about my own life. You know, and my teenage years were tough going, uh, so I, I learned a lot about anxiety and experienced an awful lot of anxiety. And, you know, I, but for the grace of God, I could well have in, in, ended up within the psychiatric si uh, system. I didn't, but I could have. And I can see how easy it is for people to slip into that. And it's sometimes said, and I know I'm going on and on, this is supposed to be the last question. But, um, you know, it's often, I've heard it said, and I've seen how true it is, that, you know, it, 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 it's, it's often not that easy, not that difficult to get into the psychiatric system, but it's damn hard to get out of it. <laughs> and um, I've seen that over and over. Singing through the clouds. Sing. Sing it through the clouds. 
Instead of pain 